I will be talking today about uh, uh, using neural networks to study open quantum systems. Um, I'm currently a, a, a remote uh, research fellow at uh, the Flatiron Institute, but most of the things I will be talking about today, I worked on uh, during my PhD uh, in, uh, in Cristiano Ciuti's uh, group in Paris, in a university that changes name every six months. So I don't know the name anymore. Um, so you've heard many things about open quantum systems. In, maybe in particular, one nice thing of this framework is that we can use it uh, to model the, uh, the losses, the, some noisy process that affect quantum computers and uh, quantum simulators. But I come from, uh, from the field of, uh, of quantum optics. And for me, it's actually a framework that allows me to study what happens if I take a system that is uh, coupled to a thermal buff, and then I drive it away from its equilibrium state, like I would do with a laser or with drive. Another thing that I can do with uh, this framework is describing parametric buffs, so buffs that are not thermal and therefore cannot be easily described within the framework of equilibrium quantum mechanics. And in general, what we, have, what we see when we study those systems is that some new paradigm when we study phase transitions or when we talk about symmetries emerge. And uh, it's actually quite interesting because uh, we can use it to study uh, the systems that were, were there when this framework was invented. So quantum optical systems such as semiconductor micropillars or superconducting circuits. But it can also be used to uh, develop something very new, such as the microwave cavities that Sholkov uh, built in Yale that uh, exploit some dissipative symmetries uh, to enhance greatly the, the lifetime of the qubits, uh, or even to describe some biological system such as chlorophyll. In general, well, you've seen this slide a few times already or today, uh, the state is encoded into a density matrix. And this density matrix uh, is evolved by a master equation, which plays a bit the role of the, um, of the Heisenberg equation of motion. Essentially, we evolve it with a commutator with a Hamiltonian, and this is the coherent part of evolution. And then we also evolve it uh, according to some incoherent evolution that essentially tells me how the system is interacting with the environment. Now, I don't want to get in the details of this master equation. You can uh, just think that uh, we are trying to solve this uh, differential equation where the time derivative of the density matrix is given by this product uh, with the uh, Liouvillian, this uh, calligraphic L operator. The problem is that the Liouvillian is not as well behaved as the Hamiltonian because it's not Hermitian, so it has a complex spectrum. Um, the, the time evolution it generates can only go in one direction. So it's a bit more hard to, to deal with it than, than, than an Hamiltonian. In general, in open systems, we want to study the steady state, so the state that is no longer evolving. And then there are quite general assumptions of time, of not having anything that depends on time. This is usually the case, or being in the rotating frame. So actually, if we want to study the steady state or the time evolution of an open system, we immediately find that the problem is that the that we have was uh, exponentially large Hilbert spaces where our density matrix lives. And therefore, over the years, uh, several techniques have been developed to, to address this problem. So cluster methods that uh, truncate to quantum correlations have been proposed. Uh, tensor network methods have been generalized, uh, though they mainly work in one dimension. Uh, renormalization methods that select just uh, one tiny part of the Hilbert space have been proposed, but they are bounded by entropy. In general, like this list is not exhaustive, but uh, in general, when, when I was uh, doing my PhD, I, I found out that um, we, would, we could not, we did not have a method that would retain quantum correlations and at the same time not be bounded by entropy that would work in two dimensions. Um, so, of course, uh, I saw the paper by Giuseppe and uh, I was studying quantum optics, so I set it aside for a an year. And one year later, I, I, I gave it a look again, and, uh, and I started to look how we could encode operators and density matrices onto neural networks. 
So the simplest thing you can do is uh, noticing that the density matrix uh, rho uh, has two sets of indices. The indices of a rho, sigmas, and the indices of the columns, so those sigma tildes. And you can just think of them as just one single set of indices. So that's the way uh, of thinking inspired by choice isomorphism. And uh, what happens is then you can just mix all those parameters into a neural network, like this is a one layer uh, feed forward network or like an RBM. The problem is that, I mean, we can do better, right? So we can actually, uh, I mean, we have representation theorems, but people right, talked about that, uh, that tells us that these will, uh, these will, we, this can approximate any function if provided that the hidden layer is large enough. We can make those networks deeper. So these in general should work better. We can use convolutional layers. We can do many things, but we are forgetting about one thing, that is the fact that the density matrix is emission and it's positive definite. So it has a positive spectrum. And therefore, during our learning or optimization procedure, we will have to recover those two properties. So we would like to have an answer that actually enforces those two, those two properties. Hermitianity is quite simple to enforce. We just need to divide by two the number of parameters in the first layer and reconstruct it uh, somehow ad hoc. But positive definiteness, it's quite hard. So the first paper that, uh, the paper that I know of that addresses this problem is uh, one by Giacomo Torlai and Roger Marco, a of 2018, where they showed that it's possible to construct a network uh, uh, that can only have one hidden layer. So you cannot do a deep network out of it. And this network will have a, a positive spectrum if built properly. Actually, their network is a bit more complicated because they used the, uh, uh, they, they divided the, the mixed part and the pure part of the density matrix, but the idea is still the same. We cannot make this deep. Uh, so actually this is, even if we cannot make it deep, it's actually a quite general ansatz. And any parameter that we feed into this, uh, uh, these ansatz will give us a valid density matrix, though one normalized. So we decided to look at what we could do with these ansatz. And um, there are actually two things you can do. Either you study uh, you go directly for the steady state or you actually try to find uh, the real-time evolution. So the real-time evolution uh, is very similar to what was talked about this morning. Um, essentially, you remap the time evolution onto, uh, onto a dynamical equation that tells you how to update the weights at every iteration, at every time step. And uh, uh, essentially, you have to build up this S matrix the stochastic reconfiguration matrix is the F uh, vector, which can be obtained just by sampling. And, uh, it had, and essentially there are, in the context of open systems, it has been uh, done at the same time by those two papers that came out at the same time. One by Alexandra Nagy and Vincenzo Savona at the PFL and another one by Hartmann and Carleo that uh, the two papers essentially try to do more or less the same thing. And they showed that this, that, that this approach works. However, a main limitation of this method is that uh, this S matrix uh, uh, cannot be biased. So we have to sample it to a very high precision. And this is uh, not an easy task to do. So when I started to look at the problem, I tried to see what we could do instead when targeting directly for the steady state. And of course, this can be done by remapping it onto a minimization problem. This was already discussed in 2011 by Heinrich Weimer in a very interesting PRL, who essentially showed that what we need is a, somehow a cost function or a variational principle. Uh, so a functional that would be exactly zero uh, when the weights give us steady state and and that would be positive so that I could optimize it toward the global minima. Of course, um, like in this paper, he argued that we would like to uh, normalize the density matrix by its trace, so have it give it a physical normalization. And he proposed to use the trace norm. Actually, he said that the only possible norm, or the only norm that is not biased, is the trace norm. The problem is that the trace norm for, uh, for a neural network is very hard to compute. For a neural network ansatz, you would need to perform a singular value decomposition of it, and uh, that is in general very hard to do, though it 
can be interesting to do with automatic differentiation packages. Um, in general, it doesn't scale efficiently to very big systems. So instead, what uh, we did, and uh, like we published uh, at the same time as uh, Yoshok uh, Yoshioka and uh, Amazaki, uh, last year, uh, we attempted to normalize the density matrix uh, by the L2 norm, and uh, and we computed the L2 or Lebesgue norm of uh, of uh, of the uh, of the time derivative of the density matrix. One advantage of this is that uh, we can actually is that uh, we can actually sample this quantity. So we can rewrite it uh, in such a way that we are sampling the entries of the of the time derivative of the density matrix, and uh, the cost function overall looks like um, uh, looks like uh, somehow optimizing, minimizing the variance of a ground state of an Hamiltonian system. So it's not exactly the same. So to show that like this is indeed a, a procedure that works, and you can optimize it. We considered a driven dissipative quantumizing model, where essentially we have spins coupled along the z direction, along a 1D periodic chain. Um, we have a transverse x, uh, we have a transverse field along the x direction, and we have uh, we couple the system to a zero temperature bath that de excites my, my spins. Uh, we studied the magnetization on a chain of six insights. Uh, first, we showed that you can minimize. The, the this cost function and it, like they're basically finding the global minima in this weird surface potential surface cost function surface and then we showed that you can uh, that you're also essentially optimizing um the observables at the same time and they converge to what we expect what we computed with exact method the only tricky thing compared to um to more say uh, hamiltonian problems is that you need to run a different Markov chain for the observables because they are computed by taking a Markov chain along the di diagonal, the real diagonal of the density matrix. We showed that uh, you can, if we perform a scan along uh, the magnetization, uh, what we along the transverse field, we see that uh, we have very good uh, convergence to the exact values, except for the intermediate region where uh, one observable uh, the, does not converge exactly. So first, uh, we showed that by increasing the width of the network, of course, so we can increase systematically the, the precision. However, in this intermediate region, we could never get it to converge to the exact value. And uh, I believe it's linked to the fact that um, actually we were converging, uh, we were approaching the, the, like the cost function was always going down, the gradient was always, uh, negative, but we were never getting to the, to the minima because it was too slow. And I think this is, uh, this is actually linked to the fact that in that region, the, the Duvillian gap, the gap of the system is becoming smaller. So everything that I showed here uh, had been done with Julia at the time. Uh, so you could also take the code and run it yourself. The problem is that at some point uh, I realized that if I want to play with, with different networks, I need an efficient automatic differentiation tool to compute the gradient of those networks. And Julia, unfortunately, uh, is not fit for the job at the moment. It's a bit too young. So, of course, Python came and Giuseppe proposed me to start working on implementing the same method in NetKit, and that's what I did. So I would like to briefly show you, or to anyone who is interested in trying out those problems, that you can actually do this in NetKit uh, since the version that has been released a few days ago, uh, a few weeks ago, sorry. So, well, apart from importing a bunch of stuff, as you might see, essentially we need the, the Pauli operators. Um, we, def we have, we, like in this example, I would be showing you how to uh, simulate uh, 10 spins with some uh, parameters of a transverse field G and, and the coupling parameter V. Uh, you need to create, uh, of course, the lattice uh, upon which your system resides. Uh, it's periodic with periodic conditions in this case. You need to create the Hilbert space of your spins one half. Um, then you need to construct your Hamiltonian by adding each piece, each single operator, either single particle or two particle operators one at a time. Uh, 
you will need then to define a list with a jump operators or dissipative operators, and you need to put all of those together into a Liouvillian object. So the interface is quite similar to Qtip on purpose, so that it's more familiar to users. Then uh, the juicy part, so the netcat part, let's say, is actually defining a density matrix. So uh, the NDM spin phase matrix is uh, the one I was using here. Uh, you can define the width of the pure part, alpha, and the mixed part, beta. You can, you, you can initialize it to have random parameters defined up, uh, on a Gaussian. Uh, and then, like this is where you actually can play a bit, you can define a sampler for the density matrix and for the observables that must be sampling only the diagonal. Then, like the, the, the code is really the same as, uh, as any other uh, Netcat run. Essentially, you need to define the optimizer. Uh, here, we, I'm using the stochastic gradient descent. You need to, if you want to use it, you need to define the stochastic reconfiguration parameters that you want to use. In this case, I'm using a small shift, um, which basically tells you how good can, uh, can be your optimization overall. And then you need to put everything together. So you pass in the Limbladian, the sampler, the optimizer. You choose how many samples you want to take, and then you must do the same for your observables. Of course, you need much, much fewer uh, samples for observables in general. Uh, you can define what observables you want to compute. So in this case, I'm computing just S X and uh, SZ magnetization. And then you can just run. And you can really reconstruct the same plots I was showing you. Uh, before. So with that, uh, I would like to conclude. Um, essentially, I showed you that uh, density matrices can be approximated with neural networks. Uh, variational Monte Carlo is an efficient approach for open quantum systems, even if many things, yeah, we should still, we can still improve on the method. Um, more work is surely needed uh, to develop better answers. Particularly, it would be nice if we could use deep networks and uh, still keep positive definiteness. Um, we still have to start playing around with uh, encoding symmetries on, on the density matrix. Um, and there are like using autoregressive models, maybe, and uh, a lot of other things. So with that, I would like to thank, uh, to acknowledge my collaborators on, on the data that I showed you uh, from, uh, from the Paris region and also Giuseppe, with whom I've been working a lot recently, and you for your attention. Thank you.